Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. Joining us today is our colleague Chris Edwards. He's the director of tax policy studies at the Cato Institute and editor of downsizinggovernment.org. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Chris. Thanks a lot for having me, guys. How's that downsizing government thing going? Yeah, 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 I know. You've been working at it for so long, so we're going to have to assess your, <laughs> well, you your know, progress. When, when, <laughs> when President Obama uh, came to office, uh, uh, right after uh, you know he won the election, he said something to the effect that, you know, we're going to uh, go through the federal budget line by line and cut out all the wasteful uh, and unnecessary programs. And uh, well, we thought here at Cato, gee, that's a good idea. Maybe we'll help them. And um, I talked to Ed Crane at the time, and uh, his original conception was to have let's have a, a guide book to every federal government department, and you know, with solutions to uh, uh, you know uh, cutting the agencies, and uh, of course, the uh, the uh, a lot of young folks don't read books anymore; they read the uh, the internet. So we thought of the the idea of a, a website to uh, to guide policymakers and inform the public about uh, cutting. Uh, cuts that we can do to every federal uh, government agency. Unfortunately, Obama didn't follow through on uh, on his uh, suggested cuts. So uh, we've uh, still got a long uh, menu of uh, cuts available at uh, Cato for policymakers who are interested. I mean, but it seems that I'm not sure. Trump maybe will be, but he's a growing other parts of the government. Has the total size of government been shrinking at all you, from the numbers you have? No, I I don't think uh, President Trump, to his credit, he uh, has a very good uh, budget uh, director in Mick Mulvaney, a former uh, conservative member of uh, Congress, who has you know proposed two very good uh, budgets now with uh, really dozens and dozens of pretty substantial cuts to everything from uh, you know food stamps to farm subsidies. Uh, but Congress hasn't followed through really at all. It's basically thrown the, the Trump budgets in, in the garbage. It's true Trump wants to, you know, has expanded defense spending greatly, uh, but he has proposed cuts to many other areas of the government. What's the total federal budget right now? Uh, it's around $4 trillion a year. And how, how does the budget get spent generally, not like specifically, but the kind of cuts, you know, if you cut I don't know, a little housing program or something in, in – education or things like that, is that really going to do much to affect the budget of the federal government? So, you know, the, the big part of the, the federal budget over half now is entitlement programs. Social Security itself is a trillion dollar program, believe I thought it, it was foreign not. aid was all of it. <laughs> <laughs> and public broadcasting. Yeah, so, of course. Yeah. So, of course, Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid are the, you know, the, the real elephants in the, in the federal budget, um, trillions of dollars of spending there. Uh, but, you know, I think, all, you know, if we were ever going to get this uh, government under control, we got to uh, do cuts across the board to everything. For one thing, that'll be perceived more fairly. If you actually had a reform-minded Congress and, and president who wanted to do cuts, I think cuts across the board to every federal department would be perceived to be more fair and maybe more likely to actually get through. When you cut a program, the money that's going into these programs, how much of it is actually being used for the output the program was created for such that like so you know we propose a across the board 20% cut you're going to get 20% fewer services however we define that versus we cut it by 20% that there is there's enough slack in these programs you know by too many administrators whatever that you could you could get that 20% out without really cutting the the quality of service or the quantity of service so the government does two things it produces stuff and it transfers income uh, and these days uh, the biggest part of what the federal government does is it transfers income so uh, the government produces stuff. The uh, national defense is the main thing it produces, but it also produces, you know, the Census uh, Bureau and the Patent Office. Those are actual services the federal government uh, produces. So if you were to cut those programs, it would have an uh, immediate uh, effect on, uh, you know, how much how much services the government provided. Uh, but most of the, the federal budget is uh, simply transfers, Social Security, uh, $700 billion of uh, aid to state programs, um, uh, like housing programs, for example. Uh, so if you cut those programs, you're cutting direct benefits uh, to people, which in my view is a good thing. Uh, you ask how much bureaucracy is sort of in these programs. Of the $700 billion the federal government spends on aid to state programs for things like housing programs and highway programs and urban transit programs, about 10% of the cost of those programs is just the bureaucracy in Washington. So if we spend, say, $50 billion a year on housing 
uh, subsidies. That's money that the federal government taxes. Uh, the, gov- the federal government will keep about $10 billion of that, and then about $40 billion will be dished out to state governments to spend on, uh, on housing programs. Why do federal programs or pretty much any government proposed thing we're going to expand the highway or build this train or build a VA hospital or something like this, why does it always seem to cost substantially more than projections? I mean, maybe maybe it's just that I'm reading just those headlines as opposed to the ones when they come in under budget, but I, I don't see, feel like I see that very often in, in, you know, in my home state of Colorado, they have this VA hospital, which is the overruns are almost comical at this point, but why is that so often the case? Right. That's not just your perception. That is the reality. There's been a number of academic studies that have have looked at dozens and hundreds of uh, big government projects, highway projects, and urban transit projects, and and uh, building projects. Um, not only in the United States, but in Europe, there's been lots of studies, and uh, there is no doubt that that government projects, especially big complex projects, end up costing almost uh, double, uh, or sometimes even more, the original projected cost. The reason appears to be uh, not just that the government has a lot of bureaucracy and the like, because uh, if the government was and, and policymakers were fairly um, estimating the uh, the cost of projects, they they would look at the cost overruns on past projects and they would adjust their projections. But that never seems to happen. They always seem to uh, lowball the cost of projects. So the reason is they do it on purpose. Uh, they lowball the cost of projects to get the, to get them through the legislatures, um, and then um, uh, when when they're actually uh, in the process of constructing the the projects, uh, uh, the uh, they go, "Gee, sorry, we made a mistake. We left out these critical requirements we need for the program." It's like they'll they'll uh, they'll vote on a fighter jet that's supposed to cost a hundred million dollars a unit, and uh, it'll end up costing two hundred million dollars a unit because uh, the the defense contractors will say. Uh, you know, we want these additional bells and whistles on here, and policymakers will say we want these bells and whistles on, and so the, the costs just inflate. And there's no there's no consequences uh, generally to, to to politicians. The politicians, if you think of military cost overruns, the the politicians just blame the defense contractors, and defense contractors, you know, blame the politicians for not giving them, um, um, you know, the the proper uh, you know uh, details of the projects up front. So there's a blame game, and uh, but this this continues year after year the cost overruns. Is that related then to why it seems to be so difficult to actually cut any spending? I mean, it, like if you ask, if you kind of go around to Americans and say, "Hey, do you think the federal government spends too much?" You tell them the size of the, you know, the budget. You tell them the size of the debt. Um, you ask them to look at how much money comes out of their paychecks and taxes. Probably most of them would say, "Yeah, it'd be great if it spent less." But and and we get candidates like Obama who are like, well, we're going to go through and we're going to cut out, you know, and it's or in, in the medical stuff, it's always the waste, fraud, and abuse that we're going to get rid of and so on. But then it doesn't ever seem to happen. And so what, what makes this such a hard problem? I think I think a couple of things. One is uh, policymakers never admit they made mistakes. If you think about the private sector, if you have a CEO of a, a company that makes a really bad bet and spends a lot of the company money on something that turns out to be really uh, a bad uh, choice, uh, the company will start losing money. Investors and shareholders will, will realize it. You know, the, the financial uh, press will start writing bad things about his choices. And he, like he like has new to Coke, <laughs> like new Coke. Right there, you go. Or Crystal Pepsi. That's right. Yeah. Business leaders have to eventually. Um, admit their mistakes. Politicians never do. Politicians enact these um, programs. They promise um, the world to everyone. They promise all these lovely benefits. The programs um, never end up uh, working uh, as they're uh, supposed to. They cause all these negative uh, side effects that the politicians didn't think of. But have you ever heard a member of Congress admit that they made a mistake on a program. They never do. So that's part of it. And the other part of it is log rolling, which is a central and fundamental problem with the way Congress uh, works. And it's something that I don't think our founders uh, really got. They got the idea that there would be factions and special interests. I don't think they got the, 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 um, the reality that as the federal government got bigger, um, co- Congress would not work like this sort of the simple naive view of a democracy that pol- policymakers would get together and you'd have a majority vote for programs that seem to make sense. That is not how Congress works. How Congress works is like this. You have a, a small groups of legislators over here on one side who have a really dumb program that doesn't make any sense for the country, but maybe it benefits some special interests uh, in their districts. They can't convince uh, other members of Congress to go along with their program. 
a different part of Congress. You'll have other members with a different dumb project that is going to cost a lot, but it benefits um, people in their district. So, uh, you know, they, they both get a light bulb. Hey, let's get together. We'll join these two uh, kind of dumb projects that don't make sense on a cost-benefit basis stand standalone. And uh, they agree to vote for each other's projects, and they and they eke out a bare majority in the legislature, and these projects pass. You see that log rolling um, uh, uh, problem manifest itself in, in bill after bill. I mean, with farm bills, for example, um, you know every different crop, corn and soybeans, uh, uh, and and the rest, they get together and they say, "I'll vote for your crop if you vote for my crop." And then they get together with the urban uh, left of center legislators and say, "If you vote for our farm program." Programs, we'll vote for the food stamp program to help urban uh, uh, inner city folks. And, and you go through uh, program after program, and this is how dumb programs pass Congress. And of course, once they're passed, as I said, uh, politicians never admit that they made mistakes when these programs cost end up costing a lot more, as you said, Trevor, uh, and, uh, and, and they don't work very well. So you mentioned special interests, but what is a special interest? I mean, isn't a special interest ultimately just Americans? Like is, an interest, is there, like a group, we're right. all we all we're all unique. We have different we all have things interest. that we care about. So, is about. there is there a definition? Is it a term of art? What is a special no, interest? No, of course, it's it's a judge it's a judgment call. Um, he, w- one thing that has really strikes me about uh, the U.S. Congress is how unbelievable, poor, uh, believably parochial uh, it is. Uh, we all we all know this, but it is astounding when you watch it up close over many years. That you know, members of Congress, uh, uh, we, we, you know. People in the districts vote for them. They assume they're going to go to Washington and do things that are in the general, broad national interest that are good for all of us. You know, um, you know, studying the you know um, national defense and determining the proper uh, size of the Pentagon budget, that sort of thing. But in fact, they spend the vast majority of their time um, fighting for business interests uh, that are powerful in their state. If you're from a farm state, you vote for farm subsidies and other narrow parochial things. Members have this enormous uh, emotional attachment to their states and their districts, and they put that uh, above you know, the general broad public interest of Americans time after time. It's remarkable. Is that, uh, is that bad inherently? It seems that that's part of the point. Of having localized representation in the House of Representatives, that it would it it doesn't seem to be corruption if you work in if you represent Seattle and you listen to Boeing when they call because many people in your district are employed by Boeing and Boeing does a, brings a lot to the community. So it doesn't seem strange that you would vote things to help your district. That might be their job and what they're supposed to do. Right. But the basic problem is this, is that you have to first think about where is the the proper and most efficient level of government to deal with certain issues. So properly local things like uh, housing policy, uh, it can best be dealt with by state and local legislators because they are they live within the area that will be affected. They can properly balance the costs and benefits of the taxes and regulations that they're going to um, impose uh, on the public. They'll hear back from the public if the program isn't working properly. The problem is that these members of Congress who, frankly, they want to fix potholes and housing problems in their districts, they go to Washington where they're supposed to be dealing with national issues and they and they want to they want to deal with all those local issues at the federal or national level. And that's the basic mistake, it seems to me. So we've talked about the budget, but then there's the debt. Um, so what is what is the debt at um, and and is it a point where we should really care? Uh, absolutely. The uh, it's one of the greatest uh, crises facing our country in uh, years down the road. The uh, the federal government debt will be a trillion dollars in the new fiscal year twenty nineteen that that uh, starts soon. The the deficit uh, right the the federal government debt is around twenty trillion dollars. I have to pull up a website because it's, it's just <laughs> ticking right. You know it's, it's moving that's, so fast that you right. you can't say it before it's already changed. Yeah. As a share of the national economy, the federal government debt is by far the largest it's ever been in our uh, peacetime history. The only time the debt has been uh, larger is uh, at the end of World War II. Uh, and then uh, the debt uh, fell rapidly in the decades after World War II, mainly because of economic growth. What is astounding, if you go back and look at the fiscal history of the United States back to, you know, 1789, debt has, federal government debt has spiked occasionally during wars, the War of 1812, the Civil War, 
uh, the Spanish-American War, the First World War, the Second World War. Debt spiked, but then members of Congress ultimately were f- of, of uh, both parties at, at the time, different parties over, uh, over, in, uh, over time, of course, uh, were pretty responsible and paid down the debt. As the Nobel economist James Buchanan uh, noted, uh, prior to, say, the 1930s, there was sort of a Victorian fiscal morality where if people thought debt was bad. Um, our founders thought, uh, like Jefferson and Madison, thought that debt was sort of equivalent to corruption. Uh, it... it, it um, yeah, it, it was it was caused by bad motives. It was irresponsible. Uh, that dissipated uh, and kind of disappeared in the later 20th century. And that's one of the basic problems today. The federal government has never had a balanced budget requirement. But somehow uh, before the 1930s, um, uh, politicians, as self-interested as they are, managed to balance the budget the vast majority of, of, of times. Is it possible that maybe one of the reasons that we're not really do anything about it right now, at least, is that there's like a chicken little problem. I, I remember even kind of during the Reagan administration where I don't think it topped a trillion yet at that point, but you know, there are people saying, you know, if this tops a trillion, this is going to be a crisis. And then we top 10 trillion and now we're topping 20 trillion and nothing seems to have changed in our lives. So so you have people saying, well, I guess the debt was never that big of a deal because now it's it's so big that it's hard to even contemplate that number. Right. So what has happened in the last few decades is the global economy has happened. If you go back and read budgets from, uh, say, President Carter, who was worried about uh, deficits, and, and President Reagan, who was also worried about deficits, there is a real fear that uh, federal government deficits would cause short-term immediate pain to the politicians. They thought, for example, if you ran deficits, interest rates like mortgage rates for homes would spike and it would it'd make Washington politicians look really bad. Well, the fear of that has dissipated as we've run large deficits year after year. And because we have global capital markets now, the U.S. federal government can borrow seemingly endless amounts uh, of money uh, without it affecting our interest rates. In fact, interest rates have been remarkably low in recent years partly because of Federal Reserve uh, actions. We borrow about half of our federal government debt now is borrowed from abroad, from Chinese creditors, from Indian creditors, Brit creditors. Um, and that, that makes it so that they can spend endlessly, run these large deficits with apparently no, uh, no uh, short-term uh, political pain. So when we're borrowing money, is this – these creditors that you mentioned in China and wherever else, is this basically the same thing as like when I buy as an individual a savings bond? Are they kind of just buying savings bonds from the U.S. government? Yeah, the uh, government debt is is very much akin to an individual borrowing on their or their credit card or borrowing for personal purposes. The everyone knows with their credit card that uh, you can you know you can borrow in the short term, but once you know debt sort of has this uh, exponential uh, sort of uh, 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 feature to it that the more you borrow, the higher your interest rates are going to be, and you get deeper and deeper into trouble. And so, can these creditors? So are these like banks in other countries that are lending well, us this money? Well, they're ultimately individual uh, savers. It's ultimately it uh, it's ultimately individual. So a lot of Asian countries, for example, have very high savings rates, and a lot of that excess savings that is not used domestically is uh, ultimately flows to uh, United States, uh, which has a very low savings rate, both uh, for individuals and the governments dissave. Of course, they borrow a lot. Okay, so then so these these individual. Savings. Creditors out there yeah. who have – they've loaned money to the US government. Right. Can they just like decide tomorrow? Could one of them just come to the US government and say, OK, I want my debt repaid now yeah, and yeah, then the government I, I, would have to repay it? Yeah, yeah, abs- uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, they, they'll trade. I mean, they'll, they'll, um, y- you know, of course, you know, debt that is out there and outstanding is constantly traded on international capital markets. But yeah, there could be a broad-based uh, feeling or shift in uh, politics or views about the U.S. economy that would f- would uh, result in foreign creditors saying, "Hey, United States is a bigger risk than we thought." They would demand higher uh, interest rates, and interest rates would start spiking on uh, our government debt. Federal government debt now is actually a, a fairly uh, a short term. I think the average maturity on debt is something like four years now. Um, so the go- in the short term, the government could could kind of get away with um, being irresponsible. But if there's a sort of a herd mentality to go against 
uh, to be more suspicious of U.S. government debt, um, you know, interest rates would start uh, rising pretty quickly. And of course, in recent years, we've seen, um, you know, debt problems reaching crisis proportions in places like Greece and Portugal, uh, where no one saw the problems uh, coming. Uh, and then uh, and creditors just suddenly felt very scared and interest rates spiked and caused a financial crisis in those countries. Does the primacy of the U.S. in terms of the global economy um, protect us somewhat from that? Because so a, a creditor might say like, I think I, the government's, the U.S. government's looking like more of a risk than it has been. So I'm going to, I'm going to get my money back now. Um, but, but if they do that, if it has that effect of shocking the U.S. economy and so therefore, you know, collapsing it or severely hurting it, that's going to have huge negative effects to the global economy. And so is there, does that act as a buffer that people are like, well, we don't want, even if even if we start to get antsy about the, the future of the US government, um, we don't want to go quite that far because the costs from doing that are going to be far more than what I might lose on my individual debt down the road. Well, but I mean, that's not how an individual creditor would think. An individual creditor is looking at it for his or her own uh, money. Uh, it is true that United States, uh, there is a feeling of safety and security with um, by investing in U.S. debt uh, because, you, for one thing, you know that a lot of international institutions and other countries, central banks and the like, hold U.S. dollar-denominated um, debt. Um, so, so there's that, and there's also the fact that I mean, the United States government's debt is ultimately backed by the enormous taxing power of the the U.S. federal government, and and which is backed by our strong economy uh, in general. So on the one hand, you sort of you, you suggested that this is sort of advantage of the United States, but politically, and if you believe in small government, it's a disadvantage. The fact, of course, that the United States can borrow so easily is is a huge negative ultimately for in, you, uh, individuals and, and American taxpayers because their government is, is has an incentive to be even more irresponsible uh, than governments in other countries. So I grew up in Canada, for example, in the early 1990s. 25 years ago, Canadian uh, the Canadian federal government was just borrowing uh, you know enormous amounts of money, about as much as we're borrowing now. Uh, but international creditors got very scared. Interest rates spiked, and Canadian politicians of 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 every political persuasion sort of got uh, uh, you know got the message, and they became a lot more responsible. And Canada started running uh, surpluses, paid down the debt. So that happens with smaller countries; they get into trouble. International capital markets basically force fixes on them, and they and they fix and reform themselves. So far, U.S. politicians seem immune from those sort of international pressures. When the you mentioned Greece and Portugal, when when their debt crises happened, do you have an idea what their GDP to debt ratio was? It, it wasn't you know it wasn't that much higher than where we are now. We our 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 debt is around you know hundred per federal government debt is around hundred percent of GDP, uh, depending on how you measure it. Um, and, uh, other countries, you know, some of the experts who've looked at, uh, you know, you know, these, uh, many different country examples and looked at, you know, historically have argued that, you know, you get to around a hundred percent of GDP with your government debt, you will start getting into uh, trouble. But, but as you said, the United States is sort of unique in this sense. So right. we, we might need a different right. theory for how debt works for right. a, a economy as big as important No one as knows States. when we're going to hit a wall, when the stuff's going to hit the fan. Nobody knows that. I Many times in, uh, in, uh, in Washington meetings here, I'll ask finance experts and CBO directors and those sorts of folks that same sort of question you're asking, well, where is the limit? Where, where will uh, things start unraveling? No one, no one really knows. And, uh, but of course, it makes absolutely no sense. It's extremely imprudent for politicians to keep sort of pushing ahead and running these trillion dollar deficits because eventually these are all costs that we're going to bear in the future. The uh, New York uh, Times columnist and economist Paul Krugman has written many columns saying, well, don't worry too much about the debt. We owe it to ourselves. That is complete nonsense. If the, a basic libertarian way to think about the government debt is this. In the short run, when the government, say, borrows another $10 billion to spend on a spending program, uh, everyone's happy because it's all, in the short term, it's all voluntary. The people who get the new uh, benefits from the spending program, they're happy because it's voluntary. The politicians are happy. And the creditors who lend that extra $10 billion to the government, in the short run, they're happy because they're going to get a return on their investment. The costs come in the future when the government has to raise taxes an extra $10 uh, billion plus interest, 
And, and taxes, of course, are where government coercion comes in. So government debt is like the government moving coercion to the future. And coercion is the problem here. Coercion causes all the damage and distortion on the economy from government action. So that's what deficit spending is. No one gets hurt in the short run. In the long run, you're shifting coercion ahead, uh, and you're going to create this great damage when the government tries to extract that extra tax money out of the economy. What about inflating away the debt? Uh, that's not going to happen. So that uh, governments in the past could get away with that. And uh, I mentioned that world uh, that our debt was the highest it's ever been uh, in our history. Uh, in uh, at, at the end of World War II, it, it, it peaked at over 100 percent of GDP. Uh, debt plunged in the decade after World War II, and historians have gone back and looked at looked at why that uh, was. And you might think it was because, well, maybe politicians were responsible back then; they ran surpluses and paid it down. That is not what happened. What happened was after World War II, much of that debt had very long maturities, like ten years or or longer. And the government ran substantial inflation after World War II, which eroded the real value of that debt. So debt plunged after World War II. Today, the average maturity in federal government debt, as I said, is much shorter. You're not going to be able to fool the creditors. If the federal government starts trying to inflate away uh, its debt, creditors are going to demand higher and higher interest rates very quickly. So that's the, but that is seems to be the the crux of when it becomes a problem is when people start getting scared of how trustworthy the United States is. That's is that. True is that the, sort yeah, of, sure. and that happens yeah. if they start saying, "Well, I really don't think I'm going to be able to get my money sure. out of this," and so they start kind yeah, of having and, a run and other of the things bank. may happen too. For example, I mentioned that a lot of Asian countries have very high savings rates, and so uh, you know our our biggest foreign creditors now are, are Chinese. Well, in the future, their economy may change, and they actually may start being as uh, spendthrift as we are, and their savings rates may go down. So there's going to be less savings going into sort of the global pool, and that'll push up uh, interest rates as well. So there's lots of things that can happen that could push up interest rates. Now, you, you also have recently, I think, been, been doing work on the state budget situation. Right. And how does that picture look in general? Is it, is it sort of widely variant across the board that some states are pretty responsible and some are out there with daddy's credit card, just putting everything on it? Well, I, the, the way I look at it is that politicians are the same everywhere. They're, they're short-term oriented. They, they, they follow political self-interested incentives rather than the general uh, doing things for the general public good in, in general. But state policymakers are forced to be more responsible, mainly because in 49 of the 50 states, there are pretty strong legal requirements that states balance their uh, uh, f uh, their budgets uh, every year. And there's there's some cheating that goes on. There's big fights between the legislatures and governors often on how to balance state budgets. Some states like Illinois um, have tried to get around the constraints in various ways, and they do cheat a little. At the end of the day, though, um, and just about all the states, they ultimately they have to pass balanced budgets, and they do pass balanced budgets. So if you're a state politician, a governor who wants a new program, you've got to identify a revenue, a funding source for that program, or you've got to cut other programs, or you've got to uh, try to increase uh, taxes. So in many states, for example, they're debating their highway budgets. Governors and legislators know if they want to spend more on highways, they've got to raise the gas tax. So there's political pain to match the political benefits of the spending. You don't see that in the federal government. Like I said, there's never been a balanced budget requirement in Washington. Uh, and um, because, as, as we were talking about, uh, politicians in Washington can borrow from global capital markets these days. It's been this license to just be incredibly irresponsible with deficit spending. Should there be a balanced budget requirement? Like if we could pass, say, a constitutional amendment to require a balanced budget, do you think that would be a good idea? Uh, I think in theory it's a great idea. I strongly believe that. Uh, that's something that uh, you know Thomas Jefferson strongly believed that you know that's something that that unfortunately was left out of the U.S. Constitution was a balanced budget requirement. There are some uh, technical problems with that. Uh, one is that the federal government, uh, as it's structured today, runs a lot of uh, counter-cyclical programs like unemployment insurance uh, that where the costs soar when you hit a recession. So when you hit a recession, uh, federal tax revenues uh, plunge uh, and the spending on a lot of these programs like unemployment insurance uh, and food stamps and the likes would soar. Uh, I don't think any economist would think it's a great idea for the federal government then to to have to hike tax rates greatly to try to balance the budget during recessions. So there there is that sort of there's an economics problem with it. I I, I think uh, ethically it makes a lot of sense. 
What I would say instead of a federal balanced budget requirement, I would like to see a uh, either a statutory or constitutional amendment that limits federal government annual growth. So a simple rule that said federal government total spending cannot increase more than, say, 3% a year, period. It would be harder for the politicians to cheat uh, during recessions. Uh, when revenues fell from the weak economy, that would be okay. You could run a deficit for a few years during recessions, but then ultimately you couldn't have any big spike in spending. Like, for example, when Obama came into office, he spent, you know, he had that $800 billion um, uh, stimulus bill. That sort of thing would be sort of barred by this, uh, this strict spending growth re um, uh, requirement. This is maybe a question for Trevor as our lawyer in the room, but let's say we had- You're that, a lawyer. No, I'm I, kidding. <laughs> He's uh, really not Play one on a podcast. <laughs> but, uh, what would the enforcement mechanism be for that? Yeah. Like you have a, you know, okay, so we've, we've got a requirement that says the government can only grow by 3%, but then the government grows by 4 or 5 or 6 or 7%. How do you, uh, how do you enforce that? Yeah, that, that, that's another issue with the, any balanced budget am amendment that you could go to the court possibly if you can get standing which is a totally different issue and say that the that Congress didn't obey the Constitution, which which you could do now and then the court could rule. Uh, they might be a little reticent to do that uh, because they don't always like to try and tell what the other branches of government have to do. I mean, they will, and the, but the easiest thing is to strike down a law. But to say you go back and do budgeting again, even though you already spent it, or, or and then Congress would say there's a war. The thing that scares me, not scares me, what concerns me is that all these amendments have, and maybe rightfully so, something like an emergency out clause. You know, the, the budget has to be balanced except for times of national emergency and exigencies or something like that. And, and as a lawyer, I read that and I just say, well, there, the, every Everything will be an emergency. I mean, everything's already an emergency. You know, the Patriot Act's an emergency. The War on Terror is an emergency. Everything's already an emergency. Or they can hype it up as an emergency and said, "Well, no, we're we're complying with the clause of this new amendment." I mean, we've got tariffs we, for national security. Yeah, tar right tariffs now. would be yeah. an emergency. Yeah, I, I think the answer to that, though, is you put in the clause. You say you, the the uh, limit is say three percent annual growth in total spending. But if uh, you have a supermajority vote, whatever the threshold is in House and Senate, you can uh, you can set it aside. So that's the answer to, you know, concerns about, uh, you know, war, uh, if we needed to, uh, 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 you know, spend a lot more for uh, national defense or some other crisis uh, in the short term. So in the states, the state, we hear that some of these states are in fiscally bad shape, but if they have balanced budget amendments, 49 of them, as you mentioned. Which one doesn't? Uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's like Vermont. Uh, but they, would by make tradition, sense. they balance their budget every year. So in, in like half the states, there's a constitutional requirement and about half the states, it's a statutory requirement. But the surprising thing is even the states where there's it's just a statutory requirement, they actually, they, they, they follow it. They do it. They balance their, their budgets every year. So states are in trouble because um, they uh, mainly, so unlike the federal government, um, uh, a large share of the cost in state and local governments is employee compensation. In fact, about half of all state local spending is employee compensation, which is very different than the federal government. Employee compensation is maybe only 10% or less of federal spending. Um, so uh, in, in many states, especially the, the northern, more unionized states, uh, for many years, uh, there's been these excessively uh, generous pension and post-employment uh, health care benefits promised to state and local workers. And now uh, baby boomers uh, who work for state and local governments are retiring in, dro in droves. It's pushing up the cost of these uh, these uh, pension uh, plans and health care costs on state budgets. So this was a way... It was, it, it was one way that state governments sort of got around these strict annual budget, uh, balanced budget requirements is that they made the promises now that, 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 that uh, will be imposed on taxpayers in the future. So that seems to put some states in a pretty big bind in the sense that they may have to make some pretty difficult choices. Of course, Chris Christie kind of came to prominence talking about difficult choices in New Jersey, but you have, and it's, it's a, it's, I mean, my heart goes out to some extent to the retiree unionized who is going to depend upon some sort of guaranteed salary. But if the money's not there, the money's not there. And there's limits on how much they can raise taxes, correct? Uh, right. So uh, what I would say is actually that a lot of states have been irresponsible with the overpromising of pension and, and post-employment uh, uh, post health benefits. 
However, there has been a movement now for over 10 years for states to start fixing these problems. New accounting standards came in for government entities, state and local governments, uh, to force uh, more transparency as to how much these future pension costs uh, were going to be. And that has forced politicians to start handling and making reforms to pension plans. And so there has been a lot of forward progress. In Washington, we haven't made any progress towards doing anything about uh, the giant and growing deficit. State and local governments generally, there's been resistance. The unions have, you know, tried to block reforms in the heavily unionized states. But there has been a lot of progress, I think, towards starting to solve some of these pension problems. So I think it is an example where state governments, for for a number of reasons, they they do seem to be able to solve problems and legislate. Um, and to and to fix you know things that that arise, the federal government seems to become increasingly incapable of fixing even the most obvious problems like our trillion dollar deficit. So, which state is the is the worst though? Is in the is there any state in dire dire straits right now? Or? Uh, some of them you can guess. I mean, Illinois is 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 perhaps in the worst fiscal shape. It has the lowest uh, bond ratings from uh, uh, from the the bond rating agencies, and that that is yet another check, by the way, on uh, state and local budgets. Is is that the uh, they, uh, their bonds are rated by the rating agencies, uh, and the worse their bonds are rated, the higher the interest uh, rates they have to pay on their debt. So policymakers, even left of center ones, they know that if their bond ratings fall, they're going to have to pay more on interest in their budgets, which again have to be balanced. So they know higher interest costs are going to squeeze out the program spending they like. So there's an incentive across the board to to uh, not let the debt problems get too bad in state governments. Also, a lot of uh, states actually have constitutional limits on how much debt they can uh, issue, at least how much general obligation debt they can issue. And a lot of those um, requirements actually go back to the 19th century when a lot of states... Uh, Illinois and many others in the Midwest got in a lot of trouble because they, they used uh, g- taxpayer government money uh, to invest in canal and other irresponsible infrastructure projects that turned out to be boondoggles. And there's a lot of disastrous fiscal situations in the mid-19th century that led to reforms and these uh, tighter limits on state government debt. So if we're looking at the federal level and we need to start cutting, where's the first place to start. Yeah, let's what, let's what assume is, that the across most... the board cuts are not <laughs> on the table. Um, what is, Where is it most critical to cut and where do you think if we're going to do meaningful cuts, it's most politically feasible? Oh, I thought you were going to ask, you were asking what's the most useless government program? Well, that, <laughs> you can ask that, that would too. be the first one, right? I, 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 do you have one that is your I, favorite useless? I think the useless... most obvious things to cut are the things that are obviously and logically state and local responsibilities where there's no obvious advantage to federal involvement. Education spending and housing spending, department, uh, HUD, Housing and Urban Development, and the Federal Department of Education. There's absolutely no reason for federal involvement in these activities. We're taxing people who, who live in cities. We're sending the money to Washington. It goes through the Washington um, uh, you know, bureaucracies. The politicians uh, play games with the money, and then some of it trickles back down to uh, local government. Why not just keep the money in a state or local government? Um, this is true for highways, too. I see absolutely no reason for the federal government to fund highways. They need you know, more highways uh, in Texas. Texas can raise its own gas tax, can spend the money locally. So I'd get, I'd get the federal government out of the things that are obviously of state and local concern and there's no uh, real obvious reason for federal involvement. But you don't, do you have a, so when I was doing this one Supreme Court case a few years ago about agricultural cartels, essentially, I, I ran into the Raisin Administrative Committee, uh, which is my, my favorite federal program I didn't know about before, not a character in a Rand novel, but actually this existing thing. Do you have a favorite, like, like going all the budgetary, looking through all the books of all these agencies, have you ever found something where you just said, oh my gosh, there's a federal, I don't know, gopher fund or something like that? Well, I mean, it has to be farm subsidies. The, the federal government spends about $25 billion a year in uh, you know, giving cash to uh, farmers, mainly crop farmers, uh, and generally not uh, fruit and vegetable farmers or folks who raise beef cattle and that sort of stuff. It goes to crop farmers. And I have never read in all the, in all the, uh, the, the, the pro-farm subsidy advocacy pieces any real good reason why we do this. Uh, farming is no more inherently risky than many other industries like the high-tech industry. Uh, there's no reason why farmers, farmers know that they're going to have uh, poor crop uh, years in the future. Maybe the weather won't cooperate and that sort of stuff. 
well, they should save. And the good crop years farmers should should save their extra profits because they know some bad years will come uh, in the future. They can use private insurance. They can, um, uh, you know, they can use uh, commodity hedging strategies. So there's really no inherent reason for these programs other than the fact that these programs are started in the 30s. The farm lobby groups got their hooks in members of Congress. And for some reason, every uh, member from a farm state goes to Washington and they believe that their highest calling in life is to, uh, you know, keep demanding those farm subsidies and trying to uh, keep expand, expanding them uh, every year. It's really remarkable. But I mean, even if we got rid of that, that's $25 billion out of what, $14 trillion? That's right. That's what you said. So yeah. that's, I mean, that's a drop in the bucket. Um, it's is a there, start. It's yeah. a start. So, that, so, the, the, so that, yeah. I mean, that's the kind of depressing thing about all this is that it's, you know, well, no matter no, what so, you're cutting, unless it's Medicare and Social Security, it always feels like it's just a drop in the bucket. So the easiest cut, from from my point of view, economically, the easiest cut should be the Social Security. It is the largest federal program. As I said, it dishes out over a trillion dollars of benefits every year. The simple, long-term, reasonable solution that many economists of, uh, of, of many different political persuasions have proposed is simply to slow the growth in benefits. Uh, a, a common strategy is to right now is that initial benefits rise by as nominal wages rise. If you change the law to say initial benefits should rise by just the, uh, the price level rising, which is a little bit of a slower inflation rate, over time, over many decades, that would be enough to balance the Social Security program to slowly trim uh, benefits down the road. And, and so young people looking to the future um, could see that those benefits are going to be a little less than originally planned and they can save more and plan for the future. So that, that, that simple Social Security fix of slowing the growth in benefits I think would be fair and reasonable. People could see it uh, coming uh, and it would save enormous amounts of money. But is there – you keep hearing that there's a sort of day of reckoning coming for Social Security where you know they move the date out and whatever. Right. Um, it, do you think it will take – if such a day of reckoning is a real thing, will it take that level of kind of crisis or maybe just people stop getting their checks and something for anyone to do anything? Because this can seems like it's been kicked down the road for quite a while. So oddly, you know, so around the year 2030 or so now, the year, uh, the, the uh, projected year changes uh, every year with the new uh, estimates. The the Social Security so-called trust fund, which is this accounting identity, will only have enough money to pay about 75 percent of promised benefits. So if Congress doesn't change any law that year after it runs out of money, uh, benefits will have to be cut legally by about 25 percent or so. So that's sort of the, the crisis. But uh, that's obviously not going to happen. In the, if Congress doesn't fix Social Security between now and whatever that year is, 2030 or so, uh, obviously what's going to happen in that last year, Congress will simply pass a law, um, you know, injecting new, fresh taxpayer funds into the Social Security Trust Fund. Gee, problem solved. We've seen that already with um, the Social Security Disability uh, Program, which is about a $150 billion program. It has its own trust fund, which has already run out of money, and Congress has already simply done that. They simply injected more general revenue uh, into the Social Security Disability Trust Fund. So, um, th you know, the, the, there won't be an, a, a one-time immediate crisis with Social Security. The, the problem is the same with Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. All these programs keep growing relentlessly faster than tax revenues are rising. So those programs are eating out a, a bigger and bigger share of the overall budget. Uh, it's pushing up deficits. And as we discussed earlier, we don't know when those giant deficits are going to cause a crisis, but they will cause a crisis down the road. Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and review us on iTunes. And if you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.